morning. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're, I know that this is one of those rare moments where we actually get a break, so um, uh, we could wait just a few more minutes, but I'd like to launch right in because there's a lot of really great material we're going to be sharing. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, this has been my home since 2010. Uh, I'd like to also thank AAMC for including us as a major venue in this year's conference. I'm Rich Asti, the uh, moderator of this morning's panel and the Brooklyn Museum Curator of European Art. Um, sorry I missed some of you last night at the reception in Newark. I'm a good Latin American son and spent Mother's Day with my mother in Miami. Uh, and to, uh, so I just flew in late last night, but to all the mothers in the room, happy belated Mother's Day. Um, you picked a great time, and I'm going to do some promoting for the museum as well, to visit us, even though we're closed to the public, on Mondays and Tuesdays, all five of our temporary exhibitions are on view for you and just you today. Uh, on Basquiat, Andy Wiley, Zanelli uh, Maholi, uh, Chitra Ganesh, and appropriately for our panel today, Diverse Works, Director's Choice. You've met the man who's honored in that exhibition, Arnold Lehman, our sadly for me retiring director. Uh, it's a survey of major works acquired here under his leadership. Um, also among the, the shows available to you today, uh, we've a few of us have discussed Kehinde Wiley, a new republic that's actually closing in just two weeks. So uh, please uh, take advantage of that moment here. Um, it'll continue at the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth uh, this fall, and then it'll have a national tour, which you can find on the website. Um, so these opportunities to see the temporary shows of Brooklyn today, right after this panel, is the first from 12.30 to 1.30, and again later this afternoon at the end of today's sessions from 5 to 7. But this morning, I am delighted to moderate uh, the first panel of what I love most about being a curator at Brooklyn and elsewhere, pursuing acquisitions. It's our opportunity as curators to leave a semi-personal mark on the trajectory of our institutions. I say semi because what we do here is very collaborative. Uh, I once congratulated a colleague, I don't know if she's in the room, on her many purchases, uh, which she was acquiring expressly for a very transformative landmark exhibition um, that she organized a few years ago, she thanked me and said, I love to shop. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes you get these answers and they're a little disarming. That one was one of them. I didn't know how to react, but I thought about it. She was actually right. We do shop, but uh, unlike shopping for yourself and with your own money, uh, we shop as curators for a community, as we've heard this morning, and often we rely on not our money, but institutional funding. Uh, I know this distinction, this public versus private distinction well. I was once an art dealer here in the city working for Christie's, Old Master Paintings and Drawings Departments, and uh, later Wildenstein & Company. I met some of you through those connections, uh, some of you here in the room. And uh, I remember how much easier it was as a dealer working for private clients as opposed to museum clients. Museum professionals were much more prestigious, and uh, curators were by then friends. Uh, but I was frankly sold by how much more efficient it was working with one, maybe two people, as opposed to a collective body of curators, directors, board members, uh, and sometimes community members who made decisions by committee. And if you're ever a dealer, you, you start to hate that expression. Uh, but it's a, the collaborative work of curators, of directors, of trustees, and of community board, community members and board members that ultimately seduced me to come over to this side and join a museum first in Ponce, Puerto Rico, and now at Brooklyn. Um, what was also enticing for me was the opportunity to play a key role in the development of a collection, sometimes more than one collection if you're lucky, and I've been so lucky here, and at the same time supporting an institutional goal. Making decisions by committee will be one of the focus, uh, one of the um, emphases of our panel today, which is titled, if you look at your program, Shaping Collections, Acquisitions, and Institutional Priorities. You'll hear from four U.S. curators representing a broad range of organizations, of fields, and approaches to what they do so beautifully. And together we'll address specific initiatives, communities, institutional priorities, and programs. And we'll also discuss something very fluid for all of us that keeps slipping through our fingers. What is that ideal acquisition? Something that keeps being redefined. And we'll also discuss why, when, and how an institution should consider redirecting its collection priorities. But before I introduce the panelists who are here with me on the stage, and before we launch into our very brief individual presentations, they'll be about 10 minutes each, 
uh, followed by an informal roundtable discussion, and then questions from you in the audience. I want to thank the intellectual force behind this session, its organizer, and my Brooklyn Museum colleague and friend, Terry Carbone. Uh, if you know Terry, if you've seen her many award-winning exhibitions and some of her transformative acquisitions, thankfully here for Brooklyn, you know that she has exquisite taste. And I was therefore honored to, when she asked me to join this panel along with three very innovative, forward-looking curators, Janet Blyberg, Wendy Kaplan, and Richard Woodward. We'll give our brief presentations in um, about our institutions and about our acquisitions in the following order. Richard will lead us, followed by me, Rich, to distinguish Richard from Rich, Janet Blyberg, and then Wendy Kaplan will take us home. Uh, briefly, a little bit about us, very briefly, and I also direct you to the programs. If you want a little bit more about us, Richard Woodward is the curator of African art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. He's actually the founding curator of the African Art Collection at Richmond, uh, which by now has over a 1,000 works of art. Uh, he's held senior administrative positions at the museum for more than 30 years. In 2000, he served as interim director and then senior deputy director for architecture and design, overseeing the planning and the construction of the BMFA's award-winning expansion and sculpture garden. And, I was lucky enough to see it last December. It's, it's stunning. Uh, I'm, as I mentioned, the curator of European art here at Brooklyn. I've had this position for just over five years. Uh, before 2010, I was curator of European art in Ponce, Puerto Rico, at the Museo de Arte de Ponce, where I organized exhibitions on Spanish painting from the Prado, European paintings from Ponce, Rodin, and also Impressionism. But here at Brooklyn, I've worked or had the pleasure of working, and you'll hear that in my talk, on the Spanish and British colonial collections for a show behind closed doors. Uh, oh my god, I forgot my own show's title, Art in the Spanish American Home, and opening just next month at Austin and this October here at Brooklyn, Impressionism and the Caribbean, Francisco Oyer and his transatlantic world with NYU professor Edward Sullivan. Janet Blyberg is Assistant Curator of Exhibitions, Research, and Publishing at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. She's currently working, like many of us, on two exhibitions, American Epics, Thomas Hart Benton, and Hollywood, also opening just next month, and Asia in America, opening in 2016 at both Salem and Amsterdam. It's Asia and Amsterdam. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's Asia and Amsterdam. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad I looked over to you. Uh, she has uh, served as manager for a grant based project uh, to process and catalog the Veldman Asin collection of uh, historic Indian export textiles recently acquired by her institution. Before 2012, she spent over 15 years at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, working in the publishing office, department of photographs, and special projects in modern art. Among her projects there were shows on Alfred Stieglitz, Alfred Stieglitz and Georgia O'Keeffe, and she also contributed to the forthcoming catalog resume, Mark Rothko, The Works on Paper. And finally, Wendy Kaplan is department head and curator of decorative arts and design at Los Angeles County Museum of Art. She's been at LACMA since 2001. Before then, she held curatorial positions in my hometown, at Wolfsonian Florida International University in Miami, uh, Glasgow Museums in Scotland, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, among her many, and there are many uh, shows that are uh, worth mentioning, California Design, 1930 to 1965, Living in a Modern Way. The Arts and Crafts Movement in Europe and America, Design for the Modern World, Leading, uh, in quotes, The Simple Life, The Arts and Crafts Movement in Britain, Charles Rennie Mackintosh, and just two years ago, together with her director, Michael Govan, the uh, 2013 exhibition, The Presence of the Past, Peter Zumtor reconsiders LACMA. Please join me in welcoming the first of our four speakers, Richard Woodward. which is a longtime family locus. Uh, I grew up on the other side of the Hudson and made my way to Virginia for graduate school. Uh, of course, this was before either Rutgers or the University of Virginia taught courses in African art. And I tell college students today they're much luckier than I was. How did I become involved in African art? 
Back then, Peace Corps was one avenue, not mine. Anthropology, another, not mine. Uh, knowing collectors, in that I was fortunate. There are roughly three sections in the brief talk that I have, one about collecting and the regional context. And this will resonate with what Arnold and Tom were saying ahead of me. Collegial harmony and global contemporary art with a dose of museum dynamics to boot. Um, and so without further ado, here we are. When I started at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in 1975, Africa was represented by Egyptian and Nubian works. With thanks to consultation for this from, uh, for, from this museum's Bernard Baltmer, and there was a small Coptic collection. But in the mid-1970s, a new institutional will stemmed from interest welling up in the community. It was a heady time for things African, with the transfer of the Museum of Primitive Art to the Met, TV series Roots, and the outcome of the independence movement in Africa, plus a civil rights movement in the United States. I don't know if you can see the cut line below there, but that's a sit-in in Richmond. My role has been to construct a collection and after nearly 40 years of doing so, you will understand why I take a long view of collection development, multiple strands of which I will hope to weave in this brief presentation. About the Virginia contexts, context, plural would be okay. Museums serve communities, some larger, some smaller. Ours is a large institution in a relatively small city. The scale differential owes to VMFA being a state institution and not a city one. Our museum is aligned under the Secretary of Education, and I consider that my work is done on behalf of the state's citizenry. Nonetheless, the museum is situated in historically complex Richmond, locus of Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death, major slave market, capital of the Confederacy, and home of the nation's first black governor. Indeed, even our grounds are fraught. We are situated on a parcel that was formerly a Confederate soldier's home. The land includes a memorial chapel and flaggers protest the policy that the Confederate flag may not hang on the chapel, which you can see in the right slide there, the chapel just in the background. They may stand on the sidewalk. They may not enter our property. There's one being encountered by a guard there that you see on the lower uh, left slide. In 1910, Richmond became the second city in the United States to enact racial zoning laws, a form of apartheid, if you will, later struck down by the Supreme Court. This little history capsule was intended to identify certain relevant currents in the region, but not to tar and feather it. There are many inspired people and many positive features, civic and historic, that contribute in really positive ways, not the least of which is an art museum with a global perspective but the city is almost always engaged in thought-provoking, sometimes frustrating dialogue. Also worth noting as a whole, since the 1970s, demographics of the region and the state have been changing significantly with gains in the Asian and Latino populations. Collections don't develop without resources, and those started arriving in the 1950s in significant measure as endowments for art purchases that being unrestricted as to field, the two largest endowments enabled the museum to purchase, uh, to pursue a global scope. However, one major area, Africa, was not at the proverbial table, uh, not unlike Berlin in 1884. Credit is due to the museum for holding an exhibition of African sculpture in 1953 with no one less than James Johnson Sweeney, Guggenheim director and curator of MoMA's famous 1935 African exhibition, called on to speak. It is tempting to consider this in light of such background events as the 1951-52 case of Davis versus Prince Edward County School Board, one of the feeders of Brown versus Board of Education of 1954 and a massive resistance that followed. Was the museum deliberately and provocatively heading into the storm? I wish I knew if that was a subtext, though from the write-ups, it appears that the show on the surface examined African sources of modernism. That exhibition was on view while a new wing was under construction with segregated restrooms. The museum was open to all. Hampton Institute, now university, became an institutional member in the 1930s. Works by African-American artists entered the uh, collection 
uh, and African-American artists have been among those granted fellowships since the 1940s, and so on. But legislation governed facilities and seating. When the Board of Trustees was informed that they had to provide segregated seating in the new theater, in this wing, they reluctantly complied and identified the best seats for colored people, use the terminology of the plan, um, and uh, the most frustrating duty of our longtime deputy director at the time was being there at the beginning of every event to make sure that people obeyed. Two other major exhibitions deserve mention in the 1970s. The famous Tishman collection was shown in 1970, and in 1975, masterpieces uh, from the Museum of Primitive Art, of course, now the Met. By then, the restrooms had been converted to one for women and one for men. Now, back to collecting. Exhibitions are effective vehicles, but collecting demonstrates the commitment in the very fiber of the institution and expresses its core values. Faced with starting a new collection, I believe the following tenets needed to be in play. Fidelity to the subject and its depth, as opposed to trophy hunting for expedient purposes. Um, making sure the effort, this is very important, making sure the effort would be sustained so the collection would be a living, breathing part of the museum's program and would grow to be proportional with the other collections rather than marginal or tokenistic, which I sensed could have been in the air. Focusing on the historic arts first, while good works were affordable and carefully, uh, and uh, while good works were affordable, and to carefully observe developments in contemporary art for subsequent acquisition, which in recent years has been taking hold in our acquisition program. And separating the African and pre-Columbian departments, in other words, breaking the model of the primitive art department or Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, because each, each area preserves the full dignity and consequence in the framework of the institution. At the time, we had a pre-Columbian collection that had been formed in the 1950s and early 60s, but it had gone dormant. And they said, well, you're doing African, would you just take pre-Columbian too? I did for a little while, but then thought differently of it and made that change. The results over the years, collecting African art has been sustained. The trustees and, direct trustees and directors have been supportive. Aspirations expressed by the community leaders have been answered. And for a variety of reasons, visitation now draws more broadly across the demographic spectrum than in earlier times. Audience reach might not be exactly where we would like to be, and it has not been without its hiccups, but it has moved in the right direction. While I believe that the acquisition program is the crux of the institution's strategic mission, it is not everything. Activities and outreach need to be part of the plan for it is not just what you acquire, but what you do with it that demonstrates commitment. Here are what I call some payoff images, tours. Uh, and I engage as many people from Africa uh, that, as I possibly can. It's very dark slides at the top, but that's Maasai Chief Joseph Tepanko with the high school group in the um, African uh, gallery. Um, and other tours with young people in the lower right and college age people in the center. Um, and I think the important thing here is young people now growing up with a different paradigm and a different set of memories going forward. Um, programming in the community was given a huge lift in the mid 1990s with a major grant from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. Uh, and Baba Tunde Olatunji came and had a two-week residency in Richmond training uh, school children to drum and dance. And they brought 5,000 parents and uncles and aunts and cousins on the day that we opened uh, the new gallery in 1994. And went on then later on to have African Voices through an African Writers uh, Symposium. That's Wally Soyinka, Nobel Prize winner in the center. Um, when it come, came to celebrating the 25th anniversary of the collection, the overarching museum goal was expressed as building the African program about not just collection, but the program. About this, it is essential that the museum as a whole embrace the collection, all of its collections, and share common goals across the institutional landscape. For success with key constituency, it has to become a breathe in, breathe out aspect of the institution's identity, including board representation, hiring, 
and seminars and training for staff and board as might fit the need. Also, there is no guarantee that once you attain a good state of community relations, it will remain that way. As we have experienced, a change in membership structure was very damaging to outreach efforts. That's the African department story, and now moving on to some collaborations. I'll go back to this one. Uh, we've been fortunate to have a great curatorial team. I'll give a shout out to all the MFA curators here, uh, current and former curators here. Um, we've been fortunate uh, that they have um, brought focus to similar topics in their areas. A few examples will illustrate, starting with some personalities. Uh, sadly, we don't know the identity of the Queen Mother portrayed in this image, um, but Booker T. Washington, um, here in a bust by Richmond Barté, which is on long-term loan to us, uh, is widely known, though his connection to Nelson Mandela might not be obvious. But the subjects of these two works entwine through a third personality, who is John Dubé, first president of the African National Congress, uh, who sought out Washington while he was in the United States for college, Oberlin, in the 1890s. Dubé later built a Fronge Institute outside of Durban, basing it on Hampton and on Tuskegee, um, both Washington uh, institutions. Uh, alma mater in Hampton's case and uh, established Tuskegee. Dubé and the ANC were leaders in the civil rights struggles in South Africa, and out of respect for his work, Mandela cast his vote at the Fronge Institute in 1994. Dubé urged his nephew, Marikani Tele, to attend Hampton, where he graduated in 1911 and was celebrated in the Chicago Defender. Um, if it seems I stray from the topic of acquisitions here, my point is to show how works of art can connect histories, and in this case, relevant to Virginia. And it can provide raw materials for a host of other possible outcomes, backstories, programs, articles, and so forth, and can suggest further acquisitions that can extend the narrative. Following the thread of common ground shared by the US and South Africa are works like Sue Williamson's For 30 Years Next to His Heart, which documents the past book of John and Gacy, and photo by, photos by Gordon Parks. These are truly well-chosen acquisitions by my colleagues in modern and contemporary department, um, and we did not do it by consensus. They just did it, and I applaud it. Um, and as to the panel's questions about where do objects live, I've really been energized by acquisitions made in our modern and American and modern and contemporary departments. These works are dissolving walls and connecting histories. Radcliffe Bailey, seen here, Vessel, 2012, with its reference to the Middle Passage, the Underground Railroad, and black regiments that fought in the Civil War, is currently in a terrific installation of new works in our 21st Century Gallery. How powerful it would be juxtaposed to the African Gallery, similar to my installation of African-inspired works by Alison Saar and Renee Stout from our collection, here seen installed by the entrance. At VMFA, sharing between departments has been warmly accommodated, and that's good. For our African Art Gallery, our ancient art department willingly spared a statue, see it on the very left there, willingly spared a statue of a seated official from the Egypt's Middle Kingdom, where it serves as a calling card to visit the Egyptian gallery, as does my large text next to it um, that says, African art is not only in this gallery, it can be seen in others, ancient, contemporary, even Art Deco, where we have stools by Pierre Legrand designed after models from Ghana and the Congo. About recent directions, colonial imagery is often eschewed as imp impure and unimportant. I believe the colonial works and the independence movements need further examination to re reveal the forces at play in transitions from historic to contemporary work. To this end, I recently acquired a statue of a Belgian colonial officer from Congo's Pende people that was not made as a casual souvenir item, but as a power figure that represents a known individual, Maximilian Ballot, about which we have abundant documentation regarding his death during the Pende Rebellion in 1931. At the same time, our ancient art curator, Peter Schertz, acquired this wonderful South Italian vessel of an African. Who would have guessed at one acquisition meeting, we would acquire an image of a European by an African artist and vice versa. Suddenly, new dimensions obtain. I'll conclude by addressing a few recent contemporary acquisitions. 
uh, and a project by uh, the department. Note that these were done with the interest and support of our modern and contemporary department. Sammy Baloji, young Congolese photographer whose works examine current issues uh, and the colonial past. Mining in Katanga, which this is about, was one of the powerful forces that reshaped the cultural and economic landscape of the Congo in the 20th century. For Balo and the Pende people, it was palm oil. Esther Mahangu, the noted South African and Debele painter who participated in Magician de la Terre in 1989, um, was commissioned to do two very large canvases to herald the outside of our African gallery. Uh, she worked for a month last fall in an absolutely terrific interaction with the public. She painted right there on the spot, uh, set up for a month, and was inter you know, talking with the people. We had a translator and so on. And one of the most interesting things was how many school teachers came, art teachers came, to watch her while she was painting. And all of a sudden, there was this blossoming of Indabelli design throughout the Richmond and surrounding counties, just the school system. And all of them send their images to me, uh, how proud they are. Um, here are some more uh, photographs of the setup. Uh, Esther worked with her granddaughter. Uh, those of you who know Esther you know she's now 79 years old, so it was absolutely tremendous to have her there painting basically in full regalia as she does. And uh, it was a really high watermark. Uh, and a really interesting uh, dialogue, I call it an architectural intervention, was the African gallery is adjacent to an Italianate courtyard. It was, her painting is, you know, architectural painting. And people walk in now and they go, oh, I didn't see the columns. Um, and that's good. <laughs> so uh, now uh, one more, Plengi Dube, uh, who collaborated with me in the African Art Department and VCU School of the Arts, where she taught in Sonia Clark's uh, beadworking seminar. Um, uh, she came and she was giving me expertise in our Zulu beadwork uh, collection. And actually, we have two wonderful costumes. She's going to help dress the mannequin. Nobody better in the world to dress a, Zulu, a mannequin with a Zulu outfit than a Zulu beat worker herself. Um, and then I will just conclude with this wonderful um, sort of lighthearted image. It's a barbershop sign that we recently got from Ghana on the left. And Louis Draper, untitled Haircut in Dakar, 1970s. Louis Draper is a Richmond photographer. And in this case, Sarah Eckhart, our uh, uh, associate curator for modern and contemporary art did come to me and say, we're going to be selecting works from the Draper portfolio. Do you see any here that are of interest? So I appreciated that African art was at the table. Thank you very much. presentation uh, will focus on cross-collection initiatives and community at Brooklyn, uh, which I show here. Uh, when I arrived in the spring of 2010 and before identifying potential purchases for the collection, there was already a very healthy cross-collection practice in play. Uh, I'm one of 16 curators at the museum and all 16 of us play well together. We work with one encyclopedic collection. A fine example of that, if you come back, is on view downstairs uh, in our intro gallery of the whole museum, Connecting Cultures, A World in Brooklyn. Our vision here is broad, it's also very inclusive, and it allows us as curators to transcend what are more traditional temporal and geographic borders. Uh, my borders as curator of European art are old world paintings, sculpture, and works on paper from about 1200 all the way to 1945. Uh, but at Brooklyn, the vision of Europe is even more expansive, and I've had the pleasure here of exploring many European empires across the Atlantic world. Uh, now, when I joined the curatorial team, I was told that the ideal Brooklyn Museum acquisition is an object that has many homes in this building. So I looked first to uh, someone I've mentioned already, Terry Carbone, and the American Art Department, uh, which had already a close relationship with the European art collection. Uh, that relationship goes back about 80 years. And thanks to Terry in particular and her Pan-American and Euro-American vision for American art here, um, she had already started expanding and problematizing what it meant to be American across our hemisphere by including works by British, Spanish, and um, 
and Dutch American artists side by side. This is a long tradition here at Brooklyn. It goes back to 1941, uh, when we already were thinking transatlantically and hemispherically about our European and American art collections. That year, our curator then, Herbert Spinden, a curator of Arts of the Americas, organized the show America South of Us, U period, S period. It was a major loan show, so one of the greatest titles of any show. It involved 18th, 19th, and 20th century Latin American objects. Um, in his words, his own objective was to let Anglo-Americans judge Latin Americans in their own aesthetic ambient. Uh, more recently, in 1995, Brooklyn curator Diana Fain organized a major show after a, a very smart acquisition from the New York Historical Society sale at Sotheby's of 14 Inca King portraits. They went on view in 96 in Converging Cultures, Art and Identity in Spanish America. But it's really in 1999, after that Spanish colonial exhibition came back home here to Brooklyn, uh, that Brooklyn went truly hemispheric in its American art galleries. I show here Terry's installation of a portrait of an elite Peruvian criolla on the left, the far left, Mariana Belsunce Salazar, hanging alongside her British-American counterpart, Deborah Hall, painted by William Williams in Philadelphia. Two years later, we've heard Arnold this morning, our director, speak about American identities, a fresh look that went on view and is still on view, uh, beginning in 2001. She expanded her own Pan-American approach to the collection. As you see here, Spanish and British colonial portraits mingle with tea tables from Buenos Aires and Portsmouth, New Hampshire, shown in the foreground on the far right. Over the last five years, this is where I come in, Brooklyn's expansive approach to America and our incredibly diverse community, which we proudly serve, have inspired me to take the European collection beyond the old world and into the new, joining uh, Terry's Pan-American conversation. Thinking transatlantically and hemispherically here has been the highlight of my professional development. It's informed every acquisition I've presented and permanent gallery installation, as well as every temporary exhibition. Now a little bit about our community. We serve a thriving, in particular, West Indian community. We're extremely sensitive to our immediate audiences. So when I arrived, I was told this by our educators, and Tom spoke earlier about this great, fruitful conversation between curators and educators. Our educators thought I was a very nice guy, but I didn't quite get it. I think is what they said. And they said that, um, uh, that based on some of my earlier uh, attempts at a successful acquisition, um, they suggested I come to our Target sponsored for Saturdays, which I did, and I feel it's the, the proudest moment of being a member of this museum. And um, so I began looking across Brooklyn through a European lens uh, with particular interest in the Caribbean. Uh, as I mentioned, we serve a thriving West Indian community right here. I showed the West Indian Day Parade just a few years ago in 2011, going down Eastern Parkway just outside the building. It's among the nation's largest parades, but until recently, this community had no cultural representation in the building from the colonial period. So we presented this to our collections committee. I'm showing you Augustino Brunius' late 18th century conversation piece or informal group portrait of British colonial, formerly French colonial, women of color on the Caribbean island of Dominica. Here in the New World, uh, the Roman painter from the old, old world, Brunius, portrays a social reality that he didn't have back home, an elite class of women of color. This was painted in the wake of the Seven Years' War. Dominica had just been acquired by the British from the French, and Brunia shows us a continuum of color and costume from the black African woman on the far left to the white European boy on the lower right. I saw the Brunia's painting in an art fair in Paris in September of 2010. I had just come from this museum, uh, and the parade organizers were still setting up a stage in our parking lot just outside for the West Indian Day Parade. So our West Indian community was very much on my mind. And I knew right away when I saw this picture that it was a perfect choice for Brooklyn. In fact, Carol Vogel in the New York Times, many of us have uh, encountered Carol. Uh, she, uh, <laughs> uh, she reviewed this acquisition for her weekly column in the Times, quoting me as saying, it screamed Brooklyn. Uh, uh, some, some of my colleagues here have made fun of me for that. But, uh, but when I first approached the dealer or the gallery representative uh, at that booth at the Paris Biennale, I was asked by the dealer if Brooklyn had enough money to acquire such a work. 
So advice to dealers out there, I was, I was one of them, please don't ask curators this question, it's insulting, and it potentially ends a very fruitful relationship before it even begins. Well, we did have the money, and thanks to a judicious deaccession from my predecessor here, in 2010, we acquired this work for the collection, a work that formerly graced the London home of Jane Reitzman. We've since made 10 major acquisitions, many three times the price of this one, in the area of um, Euro-American art, uh, something Terry and I have been working on. And um, i show you here two more that came on the heels of that first purchase. This is 2012 when um, we presented to our collections committee two Euro-American, here Spanish on the left and British on the right colonial portraits, painted just a year apart in the late 18th century. They were shown as I show them here to you in our boardroom side by side to the collections committee for their approval. Jose Campeche, the painter on the left, his sitter, Doña Maria de los Dolores Gutierrez del Mazo y Perez, and on the right closer to me, Benjamin West, portrait of um, Peter Beckford. Uh, showing this pair to our board it reminded them of how Brooklyn sees America, its hemispheric, and its transatlantic. Maria de los Dolores, the woman on the left, and Peter were Europeans then living in their respective empires, overseas territories, Spanish Puerto Rico on the left and British Jamaica on the right. Maria's painter was an Afro-Puerto Rican painter, Campeche, who never left his native island. Peter's painter, West, uh, did quitting Pennsylvania permanently in 1760 for Italy and then England. And speaking of the Caribbean, also in 2012, we acquired the Puerto Rican realist impressionist painter Francisco Oyer's sugar plantation painting, Hacienda La Fortuna. It was commissioned in 1885 by a wealthy Barcelona emigre who lived in the house in the center of this composition. Oyer emerged from a relatively small art community in San Juan in the 1840s, and he went on to become a very distinguished transatlantic painter, contributing to modern art movements on both sides of the Atlantic, including movements in Paris and in Madrid, such as realism, impressionism, and naturalism. And here at Brooklyn, when this painting went on view in a Euro-American context, this masterpiece served as a reminder of Europe's presence in this part of the Atlantic world, here Spain's presence, specifically in Cuba and in Puerto Rico, through 1898, through the Spanish-American War. We were very keen on acquiring a work by him that predated that war so that we could still also present this as colonial Spanish America. And finally, in that same year, 2012, we acquired what we consider a destination object, the only known colonial Mexican folding screen that's also shell inlay painting. It's known today as a Biombo and Conchado. We pair it with a print source that we thankfully found for the object after the dealer sold it to us. Uh, this elite object was commissioned by the very top of Mexico's social pyramid, the Viceroy of New Spain, around 1700 for the Vice Regal Palace in Mexico City. I showed just half, we only bought half of a massive 12 panel screen. The other half is now at the National Museum of Vice Regal Art outside of the capital. And you can see this beautiful object on view in diverse works, director's choice on the fourth floor. Speaking of Carol Vogel and critics, Judith Dobrinsky, someone who you all may have encountered as well, once questioned the acquisition of objects like these for Brooklyn because they came from a deaccession funds, uh, judicious deaccessions, but she's come around when she saw what we've been doing with the money, including uh, uh, acquiring an object like this. She said, when a work like this comes back from a national tour, uh, we don't know where precisely it'll be displayed in what galleries, it hasn't been decided, but this cultural trifecta made in the Americas, inspired by Japanese form and material, and based on European images, offers multiple possibilities. In other words, it was an ideal Brooklyn Museum acquisition. And it went on view in this exhibition I've been mentioning. Uh, now I can refer to the actual title, Behind Closed Doors, Art in the Spanish-American Home. It was the country's very first major show on private life um, in Spain's wealthy overseas territories. And within the galleries of the show, if you came to see it in 2013, we paid homage to Brooklyn's traditional Pan-American and hemispheric approach to Europe and America uh, with these same beautiful dialogues throughout and beginning next month, I mentioned a second exhibition we're working on. We'll bring the new world to the old in the show Impressionism in the Caribbean, Francisco Oyer and his Transatlantic World, which I'm co-curating with Edward Sullivan. 
here in our um, the same new Colonial Caribbean acquisitions that I've shown, it now will be presented in a slightly later transatlantic context uh, going through the 19th and early 20th centuries. Inspired by Brooklyn's transatlantic and hemispheric approach to Europe and to America, we will pair 40 paintings by Francisco Oyer with paintings by his Pan American and European predecessors and contemporaries, including the man I show here, Paul Cezanne, painting outdoors outside of Paris in the 1860s, courtesy of Oyer. This is very much a Brooklyn Museum exhibition, showcasing one of our major strengths, French 19th century painting, while also expanding the discourse to include not only our French masters, but also a, a great but unsung New World painter, Francisco Oyer. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. The Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts acquired an important collection of rare Indian and European textiles dating to the 18th and 19th centuries. The collection includes approximately 170 pieces and is comprised principally of Indian painted cottons, commonly referred to as chintz, derived from the Indian word chitra, meaning sprinkled or spotted. The fabrics are typically decorated with overall floral patterns. Prized globally for their exotic designs and vivid, durable colors, chintzes were imported to Europe and America in huge quantities in the 18th and 17th centuries. They were fashionable both as upholstery and dress fabric. Um, and these are two pieces from the collection. The immense popularity of chintz drove European textile manufacturers to develop technologies to reproduce knockoffs, and in addition, to Indian chintzes, the collection includes many examples of early European te printed textiles, and it's just a wonderful example of the technological advances that were made in Europe. So this uh, piece on the left is a painted chintz from India, and the piece on the right is a printed textile, probably French. The depth and breadth of the collection is extraordinary. There are a dozen pollen pores or bedspreads, quilts, and other household furnishings. There's a lot. <laughs> uh, this is a wonderful uh, silk on cotton embroidery. Um, there's men's clothing, including this rare unassembled banyan or dressing gown. So this was painted in the shape of the pattern and then later assembled or stitched up in Europe. There are women's gowns, petticoats, and jackets, and these are all made in Europe from Indian manufactured cloth. Uh, there are children's clothing, including some 30 baby caps, as well as several rare pieces of Indian chintz made for Asian markets, such as this fascinating Indonesian sarong. And I apologize for the really quick romp through the collection, but it's just to give you an idea of the depth. Um, all of these pieces are of exceptional quality and condition. The collection was assembled in the Netherlands between the 1920s and the late 1960s by Alida Asen van Setten, a textile enthusiast and collector of antiques. She lived in the northern Dutch province of Friesland, where chintz was particularly prized, so much so that it was incorporated into the traditional costumes of the region. And this is one of the pieces from the Bellman Asen collection. Um, and this is a print uh, from a Dutch uh, publication of, t of costumes showing uh, what, what, what is called a venka, which is a type of Dutch gown that is specific to um, Hindelopen. Pieces were carefully preserved and handed down through generations. In fact, so commonplace was chintz in and around the, home, the hometown of Alita Asen van Setten that her fascination with the stuff was met with skepticism by both her husband and father, who felt that she was throwing her money away on junk. But she persisted, and the result is a collection of such variety that quite simply it could not be put together in today's market. 
When Ace and Van Zetten died in 1969, her collection passed to her granddaughter, Lika Feldman Planton. Lika meticulously cared for the collection for more than four decades, enthusiastically studying it, exhibiting it, and publishing it. It was widely acknowledged as one of the finest, if not the finest, collections of chintz in, still in private hands. Sorry, this isn't the easiest way to do this. Certainly a collection of this caliber and importance would appeal to many institutions, but how does it represent a strategic acquisition for the Peabody Essex Museum, and how does it relate to the institution's collecting priorities? Needless to say, many museums were interested in the collection, but most really only wanted a few key pieces that might augment their existing textile holdings. And Lika Veldman Clinton felt it was important to keep her grandmother's collection together. Sometimes collections fall into your lap, so to speak, but most of the time an institution must make a strategic and deliberate move to enhance its holdings, and this is one of those moves. Before I get to the details of exactly how the Veldman Asin collection fits into the Peabody Essex institutional priorities, I need to say that a clearly articulated institutional collecting philosophy and policy are essential tools in driving an institution's collection and in advancing its priorities. As an institution whose roots go back to 1799, PEM obviously has had to rethink its collecting priorities many times over the past two centuries. And on the left, um, is a view of the Marine Gallery in about 1900 from the Library of Congress. And then on the right is a recent insta installation by Charles Sanderson in the East India Marine Hall. So today, and I'm quoting this directly from the museum's interpretive philosophy, our goal is to, quote, present and interpret works of art and culture in ways that connect art to the world in which it is made by creatively fusing art, culture, and history, connecting the past to the present by acquiring and exhibiting both contemporary and historical works and encouraging people to discover and explore the rich interconnections among international artistic and cultural expressions and traditions." End quote. So, in order to distinguish its collection, the museum seeks to acquire exceptional works of art that enable it to, fill, to fulfill this interpretive philosophy and to enhance an overall quality of a collection area. In this case, PEM's collection of Asian export art. As one of the world's most comprehensive gatherings of art made in Asia specifically for export to foreign markets, the collection consists of more than 25,000 objects made in China, Japan, and India between the 15th and 21st centuries. It includes porcelain, lacquer, paintings, silver, and ivory, and reflects the complex and fascinating interaction between the artistic and cultural traditions of Asia and Europe. In general, however, textiles were not a strong area in the Asian export art collection, and shockingly, the number of chintzes in the Peabody Essex Museum's holdings could be counted on one hand. Unfortunate, given that the global trade between India, China, and Europe, and even Salem, was in many ways dominated by Indian cottons and Chinese silks from the 17th to the 19th century. We know that as early as the 17th century, Indian textiles were arriving on Salem's shores. Local merchant James Corwin, who died in 1685, for example, is known to have stocked many East India Company textiles. And even after the importation of Indian cottons was banned in Europe and England in the early 18th century, Americans could freely buy chintz. Advertisements in the Boston and Salem Gazettes make it clear that fine calicos and chintz and India goods were regularly available and even and eagerly sought after. Indian textiles remained popular into the 19th century when William Dean Waters, a resident of Salem, acquired a large pollen pour later given to the Essex Institute, which is now a part of the Peabody Essex, by his grandson, along with a Japanese silk dressing gown. So, while it seems improbable that a collection of Indian chintz from a collector in a small town in the Netherlands should come to Salem, Massachusetts 
It is, in fact, a natural fit. Luckily, Veldman Asin agreed, and the PEM was able to purchase the textiles. Today, it would be impossible to assemble this collection, as most works of this caliber are to be found exclusively in museums. The Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the Fries Museum in Leeuwarden in the Netherlands, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Royal Ontario Museum, and as a good friend reminded me last night, the Calico Museum in Gujarat province are among the only comparable collections of this scope. The acquisition of the Veldman Asin collection, therefore, is a prestigious one for the Peabody X6, <laughs> one that has already garnered quite a bit of excitement. A destination collection such as this draws interest from textile scholars and enthusiasts from around the globe, and we hope that the collection will be soon searchable online. It is also our intent to include selected textiles in the Asian export galleries, and given the incredible depth of the collection, we will be able to rotate light-sensitive pieces in and out of the permanent galleries for short periods of time. Now, before I close, I'd like to touch briefly on the potential for cross-collection collaboration within the museum itself. Asian export objects naturally require an interdisciplinary approach. Not being purely Asian or purely Western, they tend to fall between the cracks in most museums. At the Peabody Essex Museum, however, our hope is to break down the barrier in thinking that something Asian is somehow removed from our own experience. So while the Veldman Asin collection fits perfectly into departmental collecting priorities, it also presents several other museum departments with interpretive possibilities. Pieces from the collection, for example, might be equally at home in the Indian art galleries as they might be in one of the Peabody Essex's many historic houses. We can also use it to talk about design and fashion. And in fact, one of the first people to actually come and look at the collection at Penn um, was Gary Graham, the, the fashion designer. You can see him here on the right, looking at this wonder, extraordinary jacket. Um, anyway, it's such a recent collection that we've really only begun to realize its potential. And I would like to close by um, talking about the Asia in Amsterdam exhibition, which opens in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum in October of 2015 and at the Peabody Essex in February of 2016, and it will sort of explore the Dutch roots of the Belmanesian collections. Well, thank you. subject of this panel, since it provides such a great opportunity to demonstrate what LACMA is trying to accomplish. In this case, <laughs> with the benevolent assistance of the Getty Foundation. Unless you've been living under a rock, you undoubtedly know that in 2011, the Getty sponsored the initiative PST, Pacific Standard Time, Art in LA, 1945 to 1980. With the Getty support covering about half the exhibition's cost, LACMA was able to present California Design 1930 to 1965, Living in a Modern Way. Planning for the exhibition took five years, and we took it as an opportunity to develop for LACMA a destination collection of California design in a wide range of media. Such only at LACMA collections are a key strategic focus for us, especially those that tie to specific communities in Los Angeles. Getty funding, by the way, was not used for acquisitions, and um, sadly, LACMA is the only institution of its size that doesn't have an endowment for acquisitions. So basically... Um, Excuse me, it's popping out. Ooh, fix it. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I like to describe 
our job as half scholar, half geisha. And you can see. Uh, so, of course, we had many greatest hits of California design in the collection, mostly donated by the craftsmen or the designers themselves or from the families who commissioned the work, as was the case in this Rudolf Schindler vanity or in the case of this Neutra chair donated by the architect's biographer. But there was no systematic effort to acquire California design, particularly mass production or at least serial production objects. The exhibition provided the acquisition strategy we needed, particularly when, for many industrial objects like these lamps designed by Greta Grossman or this commercial pottery, buying them or getting them donated was far less expensive than borrowing them. <laughs> it was the ideal synergy. It gave us the discipline to collect based on a narrative about what defined California's contribution to design at mid-century, when the modernist sensibilities of European emigre architects, native designers, and transplants from other parts of the US, including New York, responded to California's gen um, very special conditions. A benevolent climate, informal lifestyle, and pervasive optimism. It also gave us a new community of donors who bought into this mission. We have fundraisers devoted only to the acquisition of California design, where this desk and chair were purchased, which the German emigre, Kem Weber, had designed for the room he created at the San Francisco World's Fair in 1939. And it gave us a new audience. With 353,000 visitors during its run at LACMA, it was the fifth best attended exhibition in the museum's history. Only the two King Tut shows and the two Impressionist shows have done better. <laughs> and you know you don't compete with Impressionist paintings. <laughs> and the book is among Lachman's most successful publications. It's now in its fourth printing. So who was this audience? First, local. At LACMA, the show stimulated new interest and enthusiasm among Californians for the state's own past and its contributions to material culture. Of course, it has to be said that we were also lucky in the general zeitgeist with the popularity of mid-century modernism in general. Second, the audience was national and international as well. In addition to attracting these audiences at LACMA, New ones were reached when the exhibition traveled to the cavernous spaces at the National Arts Center in Japan, seen here, and the Auckland Gallery, Auckland Art Gallery in New Zealand, and here's the ticket booth, and to the Queensland Art Gallery in Australia before ending its tour at the Peabody Essex Museum. We use the tour to continue our mission of collecting development with more fundraisers to purchase many of the objects that we had borrowed for the LACMA venue. And we shamelessly used the tour as an impetus for philanthropy. Your name as a donor will be heralded throughout the world. <laughs> this enlightened self-interest paid off handsomely. For example, the son of the founders of the LA company architectural pottery donated these garden sculptures here seen in his garden. By the end of the exhibition tour, the majority of objects in it, such as the Sister Corita poster, belonged to LACMA. And I have to concede that this was made more achievable because the exhibition size was reduced for the tour. The objects in general aren't that expensive and the fact that most of the institutional loans had to be returned before, it, before the show hit the road. These objects, which I showed you earlier to demonstrate the diversity of media in the exhibition, were all acquired during the research phase. Only the bathing suit was already in LACMA's collection. In sum, we took advantage of the power of place 
that art from a museum's own city or region will always resonate for local audiences, particularly when it's presented in new and interdisciplinary ways. The challenge is to make the subject stand for something larger so that it is relevant and enlightening for national and international ones as well. We were so successful with California design that my department has committed to a whole series of exhibitions that will go both broader and deeper. The California and series. Three are envisioned so far, California and Mexico, California and Asia, and California and Scandinavia. The first will be California and Mexico, taking advantage of funding from the new Getty PST initiative for the fall of 2017 called LA LA for LA Latin America. Assistant curator who is with us today, Stacy Steinberger and I, are organizing an exhibition to investigate design dialogues between California and Mexico, beginning with San Diego's Panama, California World's Fair of 1915-16, and ending as the aftermath of the 1968 Olympics signaled the end of the Mexican miracle, and of course, the political and social upheavals of the late 60s signaled the end of post-war optimism in California as well. There are many compelling reasons for organizing such an exhibition. Of course, first and foremost has to be to advance scholarship, along with developing Blackness collection in this area. And this is all part of a much broader institutional strategy. LACMA is positioning itself as a center for Latin American art and culture, which is a no-brainer considering our geography and the city's demographics. The Latino population is 48% and rising. We already have exceptional strengths in pre-Columbian art, and curator Alona Katsu has made amazing progress in the past 14 years developing the Spanish colonial and modern Latin American art collections. But Latin American design and design dialogues with the United States and Latin America has been missing from the narrative. So we are making an important first step with this exhibition. And why is this such a worthy subject, as well as collecting strategy? It's a new angle. There have been far more exhibitions and books about fine art exchanges between Mexico and the United States than architecture and design. Here is Jay O's seminal study of 20 years ago about the idealization of Mexico's folk culture, and Ellen Landau's recent book, about the influence of Mexico on American modernist painters. Outside of fine arts, the only area that is well known is the influence of Spanish colonial architecture, especially that of the missions. And here's a poster advertising Catalina Island that we just acquired. We will be telling new stories about this, such as the way mission imagery persisted even to the 60s as seen in another recent acquisition. And what is not well known, but reflected here in a 1938 development in Mexico City, is how the revival styles that California borrowed from Mexico's Spanish colonial past were then reappropriated by Mexico as essential to the country's national identity after their revolution in 1910, in a style that became known as Colonial Californiano. <laughs> Modernist links in design and architecture between California and Mexico are also greatly understudied, and this is a major goal of our exhibition on collecting. A few examples of recent acquisitions, all but one made in the past six months. A chair by a Bauhaus-trained American, Michael Van Buren, who spent his career in Mexico City and was recognized in MoMA's famous organic design exhibition in 1941 for furniture like this, which is a updated version of Mexican vernacular forms. And here, for okay, $4,000, <laughs> a 
Uh, buy it now. Um, a 1952 chair by Edmund Spence. Um, he was a, another New Yorker, um, but he designed for a Mexico City company, and this chair was reported in the press as being particularly suited to the Southwest, and it was advertised in Los Angeles newspapers. Los Angeles designers Evelyn and Jerry Ackerman had workshops in Mexico where this mosaic was made about 1958. This piece was acquired for the design uh, for the California Design Exhibition, but will do double duty. It'll be used again for this new exhibition. The Ackermans also imported the work of Mexican architect Pepe Mendoza, as seen here. We will be able to show the ad from the Ackermans Gallery with some of the actual pieces they imported. Los Angeles writer and proselytizer for modern architecture, Esther McCoy, loved the work of Mexican designer Clara Porset and arranged to have her modern vernacular chairs brought to Los Angeles, where they were photographed about 1952 by the legendary photographer Julius Shulman. Sadly, we don't own any of these, so if someone knows where one is, please don't be shy, let us know. We are building on the work we did in California design um, to study subjects like the influence of California's post-war case study houses in Mexico, which is clearly seen in this 1954 image of a house in Cuernavaca down to its Eames furniture. And just to contrast and show the close correspondence, here is Richard Neutra's case study house number 20, completed in Pacific Palisades in 1948 and published in Arts and Architecture magazine. Neutra was particularly influential in Mexico. Such explorations have led to new donations for LACMA. This very California indoor-outdoor <laughs> image, well, maybe except for the people, the uh, peacock. Um, <laughs> this is a 1966 Frances uh, Francesco Artigas house outside of Mexico City, and it was donated, uh, this very rare book of photographs was donated by the architect's partner. So to conclude, of course, the advancement of scholarship is a sine qua non of any curatorial endeavor. But if collection building through exhibitions can be shaped towards larger museum initiatives, then everyone's a winner. The California Design Exhibition, and now California Mexico, offer a case study of collection building as a response to place and population. While LACMA prides itself on being an encyclopedic museum, we can never hope to have collections to rival older East Coast and Midwest institutions. What we can offer, however, is an encyclopedic museum with an innovative twist, sharing particular art historical narratives from a California perspective that resonates for local, national, and international audiences. Thank you. Janet, thank you, Richard. I hate when I'm given a time on that schedule, and you only had 10 minutes, maybe a little more, so I apologize for rushing you. You had so much to say, and it was so fruitful. Um, just to recap before we, we, we go into questions, Richard, you're, I think, the only one on the panel to speak about pioneering or actually constructing a collection, in your case, African Art at Richmond, uh, giving us insight at into when and why an institution should make this decision. I'm just going to recap for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I loved about your, your talk was how this is a priority that's sustained, and I think some of us uh, fall short at times on getting very excited about initiatives and then not um, sustaining them. So you, you showed even these ongoing acquisitions, but for Delaney, Elizabeth Catlett, uh, but mo more recently, even the Ghana Barbershop sign uh, from about 1990, that this is something you're very much invested in and committed to. Um, just to share everyone's institutional priorities from our websites, our mission statements, in the case of Richard and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, it's to collect, preserve, exhibit, and interpret art, to encourage the study of the arts, 
and thus to enrich the lives of all. Um, I spoke briefly about cross-collection collaboration at Brooklyn, taking absolutely no credit for this, something that was in play, as I mentioned, for eight decades. I also spoke about acquiring with community in mind, in particular in our case, our Caribbean community of Brooklyn. And I also discussed acquiring for an exhibition, uh, in our case too, behind closed doors, and also the Impressionism and Caribbean uh, show uh, our institutional priority based on our website's um, mission statement, very transparently stated, to act as a bridge between the rich artistic heritage of world cultures as embodied in its collections and the unique experience of each visitor. And Janet spoke about her great success. I'm very, very jealous on the point of bitter that she was able to acquire this transformative group of works for an already outstanding institution. Um, uh, it was a major acquisition uh, of over 118th century Dutch market textiles. Textiles, I love how you cited that they would have many homes at your institution and how inherently cross-collection that field is. Uh, and uh, the collection was on the market, identified, I believe, by a colleague of yours, and, and um, you didn't waste any time, so again, I'm bitter. The, uh, <laughs> as stated in your beautifully uh, written uh, mission statement, um, your, uh, one of your priorities is transforming people's lives by broadening their perspectives, attitudes, and knowledge of themselves and the wider world. I think that's just very noble and, and beautiful. And finally, our geisha slash scholar Wendy spoke <laughs> about very recent acquisitions beginning in the past six months with a specific initiative, um, a Pacific Standard uh, Time initiative for 2017 LA for LA, Latin America, wonderful title, design and architecture, 1950 to 19, 1915 to 1970. You also discussed something else that made me very bitter, the number of visitors you had at your wildly successful California design exhibition, 1930 to 1965, and the you relationships. Surfboard in your show. <laughs> okay. From the 19th, I'll find an impression of surfboard. A, uh, and the benefits of creating relationships with new donors and sponsors. While, and, I, and I appreciate you also saying it, always advancing scholarship, but, but there's room for everything including community. LACMA's institutional priority, again, from your mission statement, to serve the public through the collection, conservation, exhibition, and interpretation of significant works of art from a broad range of cultures and historical periods, and through the translation of these collections into meaningful educational, aesthetic, intellectual, and cultural experiences for the widest array of audiences. Again, beautifully thought out and beautifully communicated. So we're just going to ask each other, or I will ask the panel three questions, and then we'll open it up to you. The first of the three is very simple, but very difficult to answer. How do we measure success when it comes to our initiatives, these collection shaping initiatives? So uh, whoever would like to weigh in. Well, let me see, is this on? Okay. That is a very uh, difficult question, and I've been asking myself for many, many years. Um, because I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Um, yes, there are, you know, surveys that you can take. There is watching your attendance pattern. In our case, the attendance pattern changing from people who really didn't want to go to the museum and didn't feel comfortable going to the museum to now they come uh, every Thursday night. We have Jazz Thursdays. They're there at five o'clock for a six o'clock perf performance. So, I mean, it's 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 turned out very nicely. But you know, there's, there's something else, and that is the anecdotal and the relationship um, uh, element. While we don't have a domino uh, board or a ping pong table um, set up in the lobby, um, I relish any time I'm invited by a community group to speak, no matter what they may be, or if they want to come into the museum, because it puts me in touch directly with the people who count. And it's just a way of kind of keeping a pulse on the community. Um, and if it's a, you know, a Boy Scout troop or something rather like that. Uh, the other thing is um, there were community leaders who were in association with the museum. And just staying in touch with them continually is very, very important. We did have money at one point for actually doing formal surveys. We lack that now. We got a lot of information out of those. 
I'd also like to add that I think that the ability to use your collection, and I think Wendy, you, you spoke about this very eloquently, but responding to audiences and also um, in figuring out the ways in which that you, you can use those objects in the future and not just being myopic in terms of um, that this, you know, that this is a design collection, but that it might appeal more broadly. Having your catalog be on the cover of Dwell. <laughs> <laughs> The number, I agree with my, my colleagues here, and you have the metrics of how many catalogs, how many bodies through the door. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of a lot of it mm -hmm. is still anecdotal, yeah. and it just means so much to me when people write letters or emails and say what the show meant to them and how it resonated for them. Um, I don't think there is any one measurement because some of the most influential shows and collections maybe don't have the numbers, but then that's why we're lucky to be at these lar larger institutions that can afford some leeway mm -hmm. um, so that, so that um, you know, an impressionist show once in a while can, can allow for a lot of more difficult programming. And um, in the case of our two shows uh, that I worked on, Behind Closed Doors, the Spanish Colonial show from two years ago, uh, did not have the numbers, frankly, that we had hoped. And we all think about numbers. I asked what the, what the number count was the moment the show closed. I think I, think I waited three days to bother visitor services. And, um, we are starting a new um, a relationship with the Hispanic community here at Brooklyn. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, a traditional relationship that we've been successful with. And um, uh, as Tom mentioned when he spoke earlier, it's not about trying once and, and, and having great, great success and then moving on. It's about sustaining this initiative. And um, uh, we hope that the Impressionism in the Caribbean, focusing more on Puerto Rican members of our community, will um, support the Behind Closed Doors initiative at Brooklyn. I always build that first colonial show and the, the um, Impressionism in the Caribbean show as parts one and parts two. Um, the, to Wendy's point about something as simple as an email feeling like a, a sign of success, when we acquired the Puerto Rican painting of a sugar plantation by Francisco Oyer, we invited Telemundo into our storage site, and I spoke about the painting and where it was going to go on view, and we planned on installing it next to Monet and Cezanne and Pizarro, in particular friends of the Puerto Rican painter, and after it aired, I had friends uh, in New York who were Puerto Rican call me and very, very emotional thank me for elevating someone from Puerto Rico to um, the canon of um, modern art in the 19th century. So that, to me, felt extremely successful. Uh, the, the second of our three questions will speak more to cross-collection collaborations. Uh, when are they beneficial? Are there any pitfalls at all to working and playing well with others at your own institutions? Uh, uh, how, something very specific, how are potential acquisitions even selected when they involve more than one department? Uh, how do you balance uh, many departments' priorities, and ultimately, where do the objects live when they come home or when they're successfully acquired? Michael, okay. I think that um, you can have all the policy you want, but I think those kinds of things come down to personalities. <laughs> and and um, some people are lone rangers. Some people like playing nicely with other kids. And I think that um, that you, you you have to get lucky. And I think it's interesting. Twenty years from now, nobody will know. It'll look like some great plan thing that happened with just two colleagues really liking each other. But um, I think, and then there are certain things like you you were that your talk was fantastic about all the different departments working together mm -hmm. and how it all does it, it does it, 
Yeah, yeah, and I think um, it can lead to some unexpected dialogues if you have two colleagues who get along particularly well and you may not necessarily think that it's a natural fit, but you can begin to make connections between collections. Um, I'm actually working on an article right now with our new Indian art curator, and she's looking at uh, a collection of kanthas that we have in, in our collection, which are quilts um, that are actually stitched by women in India, and traditionally textiles in India are made by men. Uh, and so it's a really wonderful um, cross-collection collaboration where she's looking at some, this form of personal expression and the, the chintzes are really a commercial product. Um, so it's fascinating. But there is great strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. I, I love, you know, one curator wants to do something, it's just one curator wants to do something. And if you say, we're being collaborative and we have an initiative, <laughs> somehow that gives the gravitas and you get more institutional support for it. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say the, uh, two things. I think it is um, just sort of the, uh, the, 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 the um, climate in the curatorial office, um, co very collegial and so on. I thought Arnold's comment about bringing the curators from different parts of the building together was very important. We've always been clustered, and it just you know, makes for uh, dialogue and sort of knowing what each one is, is doing. Um, I haven't seen any downside to it whatsoever. Uh, the acquisitions that the uh, modern contemporary department have made in African art are things they have opportunities and they see things, and then the ones that I've made in contemporary, you know, African art, you know, are sort of cheering each other on. So I see no downsides to it at all. I haven't experienced any. You know. And um, in, in our case at Brooklyn, I really listened when I joined and our director uh, instructed all the curators to really work with one collection yeah. and uh, those boundaries fell apart for me right away and um, not only in our installations but I, I, I didn't feel at all intimidated to approach our contemporary art curator to borrow something from her collection to put it in the European galleries or from the Asian department uh, and I was not once um, met with a no. Uh, the Spanish colonial show, as we've seen it, this is a very global moment, and it's important to backdate globalization for our public, uh, especially with shows that are historic and, and material. And it involved five different departments here at the museum. Uh, the European collection was very, uh, was very small in representation, and everyone was completely supportive. So it was, it was beautiful. We only have a few minutes left, so we'll just ask the final question. Um, even when a collection plan exists and you find that there may still be complete, um, a lack of complete alignment between these collecting initiatives and larger institutional priorities, how do you navigate that divide? If, um, how might you seek to improve the alignment without altering a goal? Let's say if you want to go rogue, how do you get away with it? <laughs> Have a great work of art. <laughs> Justifies everything. It's a little hard to top that, I think. Yeah. Well, sometimes seminars are useful too. <laughs> well, we only have two minutes left, so maybe that's how we'll we'll close. So we open it now to the um, the audience. Please, we have time for at least one, if not two, questions. If we could have the lights, please. Richard, I think you did such a good job with your comments that you silenced the room. All right, well, please join me in thanking all the panelists on this session. Beautiful.